Okay. Okay. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on participatory financing for sustainable energy. Uh, we are about to start. Um, I'm uh, Christophe Milan. I work for the executive agency for SMEs. We are in charge of uh, the Horizon 2020 program for its aspect on energy efficiency and energy efficiency finance. Uh, we organize this, uh, this webinar with the support of Climate Alliance under the frame of the Sustainable Energy Investment Forums Initiative. It is actually the ninth webinar we organize in this, uh, in this framework. And today uh, we will spend uh, a little more than an hour and a half discussing uh, participatory financing for sustainable energy. We have three speakers with us today. Uh, Andreas Röninger, who is an independent consultant and associate research fellow at uh, IDRI in France. And he will present an overview of uh, what the term participatory financing can encompass. Um, try to give some, uh, some definition of the terms and the issues also that are raised by this, uh, this concept and how it can be addressed. Then we have uh, Dan Kruppland. Uh, coordinator at rescop.eu uh, and uh, he will share the experience from the rescop missiles project working with cooperative to develop project for renewable energy and en energy efficiency uh, and also setting up a, a financial facilitation service for all uh, european energy cooperative and then we will conclude with uh, carlo alevi operations manager at uh, we are starting it's a startup present and he will present a case study on the possible use of equity crowdfunding for non-domestic building renovation. Uh, so just before we start, uh, we will have the three presentations, uh, one after the other, but we will spend uh, time also in between the session for question and answer. So you will have the possibility to ask some questions after each of the presentations. Uh, to do so, you have uh, to use the interface. You have the possibility to post questions uh, not only during the question uh, and answer session, but also uh, during uh, the presentation. So as soon as you have a question in mind, you can uh, ask it uh, using the, the interface. We will receive the question here and we select a few of them for, uh, for the discussion. We will have a uh, uh, possibility by the end of the session also to spend a little time again on question and answer, and then you can address what uh, you still have in mind after the three uh, presentations. Uh, and obviously, for the questions that we cannot answer during this session, we will have the possibility to answer by email afterwards. You will have also the possibility, and we will give you the contact information to send uh, new question by email after the, this presentation. This presentation will be made available after the, the event on the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum website. We will give you the, the contact information for that. And the full webinar will be made available on YouTube on the EASME channel. So that's all for the introduction. And we will start now with uh, Andreas Rillinger presenting the um, so for the first uh, presentation, I will unmute uh, you, Andreas. So is that working? Uh, can I do that? It's okay. I'm here. Normally you can hear me. Yeah, we, we can hear you and you, you can start. I, I will mute my, uh, my microphone now. So, hello to all. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, I'll, I'll just try to give a very brief overview on participative financing, essentially uh, on renewable energy projects, uh, a topic I've been working on uh, uh, regarding the European landscape, mainly in France and in Germany uh, during the last years, but just to give a, a quick understanding. Uh, can you go on the next slide, please, uh, Christoph? So uh, just trying to define the concept of what are we generally speaking of when talking about participatory projects. Um, 
in academic research, we generally try to uh, distinguish between two dimensions of participation. One being the process dimension. So uh, actually, who is participating in the project, who is taking decisions, who is implementing the project. So that's uh, the vertical line you can see, uh, which we call governance, participatory governance, uh, also understood as projects by the people. And the second dimension is, of course, the financial participation, so uh, projects for the people. And here we are more in the outcome dimension, meaning that uh, who will benefit from the project in the end, uh, how is added value distributed, uh, who gets a financial interest from the project, essentially. And uh, another important uh, thing is that participatory projects actually include uh, a variety of different models. We will see this later on, but uh, uh, we often have a confusion between what we call community energy projects and participatory projects. Community energy projects are actually a, a very specific type of uh, participatory projects where uh, the project is not only owned by local actors, essentially citizens and local authorities, but it's also uh, them who are initiating the project and who are taking the decision. So they have full control of the project. And we see why this definition is important later on. Next slide, please. So just to give you a, a few examples of uh, possible models, one which is very popular is uh, the citizen energy cooperatives, which are mainly known uh, from Germany, from Denmark, the Netherlands also, and now also some other countries, uh, which really are uh, in the field of community energy projects. So we have a collective of local citizens, sometimes cooperating uh, with local authorities and with private uh, project developers to initiate a project and they also own it uh, financially. Uh, another very popular type of participatory financing is, of course, crowdfunding, where the project is funded or a share of the project is funded uh, through a crowdfunding platform, generally online. And uh, citizens and other investors can participate in the financing of the project, either in terms of debt funding, so then we, we talk about crowd lending, or also investing into equity, and then it's crowd equity, which can be associated or not with voting rights, so with direct influence on the decisions in the project. And lastly, we have community projects where the project is essentially controlled by local actors, which can be citizens, but more and more it's also about local authorities taking action and initiative to, to develop projects. And all of these, of course, can uh, work for renewable energies, well, uh, these models have developed a lot in recent years, but we're also seeing increasingly uh, projects in the field of renewable heat and not only electricity, and also in some cases for energy efficiency and uh, mobility. Next slide, please, Christoph. And uh, one important question is why do we want and why do we need participation? And this could seem quite obvious, but when looking exactly on how different actors and uh, especially policymakers uh, uh, addressing the question of participatory projects, uh, we see that there can be a very different understanding of why we want to do this. Uh, the main reason which is uh, put forward is social acceptance. So when we have uh, some issues with local opposition to projects, uh, mainly to wind energy projects, participatory financing is seen as uh, uh, a driver, a solution to increase social acceptance of the project locally. Um, it's important to also see that uh, we're not only talking about the social acceptance of uh, the local and very individual project, but participatory models can also increase uh, the acceptance of the energy transition uh, in a much larger way when we're talking about uh, people accepting the costs and the urgency of the transition, for example, because they feel much more as an active participant of this transition than just uh, a consumer uh, bearing the costs. A second very important factor is uh, about maximizing local added value. Um, when the 
project is owned by local actors, uh, a lot of financial flows uh, remain at uh, the local scale and area. And of course, local actors are much more inclined to uh, uh, to invest to uh, to to, uh, to ensure that uh, local contractors will be working on the project. So, just to give you an example, uh, there was a study made in Germany two years ago uh, by a local energy company, uh, which essentially showed that on uh, on a wind project. Uh, during the whole lifetime of the project of 20 years, uh, the local added value could be multiplied by a factor eight if it was owned by local citizens and the local authority. Um, the next important reason is about increased funding for the energy transition. Uh, we have huge potential in private savings uh, in all European member states. And uh, one uh, issue today is how can we mobilize this capital to accelerate the energy transition? So uh, participatory funding, be it through local cooperatives, be it through crowdfunding mechanisms, can really help to accelerate this uh, investment into any kind of energy transition projects. Another factor, of course, is about local ownership. And we don't only mean ownership in the sense of material ownership of a project, but also uh, ownership in the sense of uh, feeling, uh, uh, seeing themselves as active participants of this transition, which can be very important in a political and social sense. Uh, of course, it's also about awareness raising. Uh, we have seen in the past that people who are uh, investing into renewable energy projects uh, and who are actively participating in projects, they of course uh, get a better culture on energy issues in general. They also are much more inclined to uh, take action at home, try to see where they can save energy, whether they can invest into energy efficiency, etc. So this can also be a trigger to uh, much more involvement in the energy transition. And the last factor, of course, is about accelerating the energy transition in all sectors. And one important point here is that uh, all the different models of crowdfunding, of uh, local cooperatives, etc., do not necessarily produce the same benefits uh, regarding all of these dimensions. And that's quite important because uh, when, when we want to implement or to support a specific model, we have to be sure that it really will address uh, the benefits we're looking for. Next slide, please. Uh, so, talking about the potential of participatory financing in, in the energy transition, just to give you a few examples. Uh, the first one, and uh, the most prominent, of course, is about Germany, where uh, we know that citizens and farmers uh, today own more than 40% of all renewable power capacity installed uh, until 2016, which is uh, a total of 100 uh, gigawatt. And they own it either individually, so we're talking about households uh, installing uh, solar panels, for example, on the roof. But more importantly, uh, they have invested collectively uh, through cooperatives and local energy communities. So here we are talking about a total investment volume that has been triggered by these local actors, which amounts to uh, approximately 100 billion euros. So it's a huge scale and this really uh, illustrates the potential we have today. It's a potential we can mobilize for uh, participatory financing. So in Germany today, we have about uh, 1,800 energy communities, of which uh, more than 1,000 are local citizen cooperatives. Uh, another interesting example, which is more recent, is in France, where the government has implemented uh, what we call a participative bonus uh, in national renewable energy tenders which was introduced in late 2016 and is interestingly uh, this bonus which amounts to up to three euros per megawatt hour of additional support for projects uh, is being used by more than 36 percent of all projects and uh, this means all renewable energy projects uh, independent of technology so we're talking about solar we're talking about wind energy uh, biomass power production etc and simultaneously in France, we had uh, the development of local community projects. So we have over 300 community projects in 2018, and also a very quick growth 
of renewable crowdfunding on online platforms. So we are expecting uh, 40 million euros collected in 2018 and up to 50 to 80 million collected in uh, 2019. And lastly, uh, very recently, the Netherlands uh, have agreed in the, in the context of the National Climate Agreement for 2030, uh, they have agreed uh, a national objective of uh, reaching 50% of local ownership for all new solar and wind projects until 2030. So this is a very, very ambitious uh, objective. We will see how it works, but um, we have seen quite an interesting dynamic in the Netherlands, especially regarding the development of renewable cooperatives. And they have also implemented one of the biggest participatory projects, which uh, is called Krama. This is uh, a big wind farm of uh, 102 megawatts, which has been developed by two huge local cooperatives, uh, accounting for 5,000 members. And uh, just to give you some other examples, uh, Scotland is also on the forefront of uh, participatory uh, renewable energy projects and is one of the only countries to date which has implemented um, a national objective for 2020. Originally, they wanted to reach 500 megawatts of commu community-owned uh, renewable projects and the objective has increased to one gigawatt by 2020 and two gigawatts by 2030. And lastly, uh, one of the historic pioneers is Denmark, where since 2008, uh, the government has adopted a new law uh, to make uh, participatory financing mandatory for all new wind energy projects. Next slide, please. Now coming on to uh, the European dimension, we had some very inter interesting developments in the last year. Uh, firstly, uh, regarding the communication on the Energy Union in 2015, where uh, it was stated that uh, our vision is of an energy union with citizens at its core, where citizens take ownership of the energy transition. This was quite interesting because uh, until then, citizens were not really considered in European energy policy and were mainly seen as consumers. So uh, they were only addressed uh, through uh, improving consumer rights and uh, decreasing prices through competition. And here we had for the first time really this perception of citizens having a very active role in the energy transition. And this has also translated into the clean energy package uh, last year, especially in the new renewable energy directive adopted in December 2018, uh, where it was made clear that uh, the participation of local citizens and local authorities uh, in renewable energy projects has resulted in sub substantial added value in terms of local acceptance and also mobilized additional private capital which has been seen as being crucial in the context of increasing rapidly renewable energy capacity. Next slide, please. So this is uh, translated in the Renewable Energy Directive in a new and very interesting concept, which is uh, the definition of renewable energy communities, uh, which are defined along four criteria. The first one is open and voluntary participation of different kinds of actors. So we're talking about citizens, local authorities, and small and medium enterprises. Uh, a very important uh, point is on governance. <clears throat> so in the directive, it is ensured that uh, renewable energy communities have to be effectively controlled by the local actors. So uh, ownership cannot belong to a larger company, for example, or an, uh, a company which is not established on the local scale. And uh, these renewable energy co communities uh, cannot be about financial profitability only. They have to provide environmental, social, and economic advantages for all its members. And lastly, uh, we're not only talking about communities which can be active uh, for renewable energy production, but in the directive it is mentioned that they can basically um, take on any kind of energy service ranging from energy efficiency to uh, the provision of energy, as a provider or uh, energy efficiency service. So this is quite an interesting concept and it becomes also more interesting because the directive also uh, gives new obligations for the member states. Uh, firstly, in terms of uh, elaborating national roadmaps, which have to be integrated in the new uh, national energy and climate plans. 
uh, identifying the potential of renewable energy communities, identifying also the regulatory obstacles and adapting uh, regulation in that sense. Uh, member states also have to promote an enabling framework, um, facilitating access to markets and to finance and avoid unnecessarily or unproportionate regulation, which can uh, affect the development of these communities. And lastly, a very important point is also that the directive gives the possibility to member states to adapt renewable energy support mechanisms to the specific needs of these smaller actors. Why is this important? Because uh, the directive basically uh, enables member states to say, um, we are using uh, competitive tenders to allocate support, but uh, since renewable energy community, communities are generally small market actors who, who don't have a lot of experience with existing projects, we can still preserve uh, a kind of uh, feed and tariff or uh, anything else for them. So that's quite uh, an interesting possibility. And we'll have to see uh, how the different member states will actually uh, use and seize this opportunity. Next slide, please. So, uh, for a quick con conclusion, um, just to give an overview, as I mentioned, it's very important to uh, understand and distinguish the variety of participatory models. Each has its own limits and advantages. Uh, to give you an example, crowdfunding essentially is much more easier to implement and easy to generalize because people just have to invest into the projects, whereas local energy communities uh, take long take longer to develop but also can create a much larger uh, dynamic in terms of development on the on the territory uh, participatory approaches of course have a huge potential for the low carbon transition i gave you some examples and i think we'll we'll hear some more today we're not only talking about renewable energy projects but we have a huge potential also in the field of uh, renewable heating and of energy efficiency and mobility and lastly uh, clear national and political strategies and adapted regulation are needed. Uh, what we've seen in the last years is that participatory models do not develop uh, naturally, especially when we are facing very competitive markets uh, made out of uh, renewable energy tenders, and they need specific support to uh, develop themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, you you propose here also a number of references uh, that uh, for people to to look and, uh, and and find also more information. I'm afraid most of it it is in French, but uh, uh, it's actually quite uh, quite uh, deep and, and and interesting. Uh, we have time for a few questions and answers. Um, we, we, we have a question, uh, we have some questions received during your presentation. Uh, one question regarding the European support and funds. So on this one, I will answer. We will send actually uh, information on funding uh, schemes and support possible for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of project. Um, there is a question on uh, the examples that you showed uh, in, uh, in Germany, France, Netherlands. Uh, and the question is, is there any transnational project or cross-border uh, example? Uh, do you have uh, any existing example of this kind of uh, cross-border project? Mm -hmm. um, well, transnational, I, I know about one solar project uh, which was developed in the, uh, on the Franco-German border in Colmar. Uh, which is a solar cooperative uh, where members established in both uh, on the German and on the French side of the border, which was, uh, I think, one of the very first uh, transnational cooperative projects. I also know that there have been various initiatives to make um, uh, European crowdfunding platforms for renewable energy projects. Uh, I know that there have been at least one, I think, two uh, uh, European funded projects on this. Uh, so I I don't remember the name, but I, I, I can give it to you uh, later on. And uh, one last point to, to mention is that regarding crowdfunding regulation, uh, the regulation of crowdfunding platforms currently is made up uh, in individually in every member state. 
But uh, the European Commission has been working on uh, a harmonized regulation for crowdfunding platforms for the last two years. And this is expected to be adopted this year. So uh, the idea is of having a more harmonized regulation through what they call a crowdfunding uh, passport, which could enable platforms to uh, basically work cross-border and be established in different member states and also uh, involve uh, citizen investors uh, in different member states. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are a number of questions regarding the type of uh, support uh, that uh, you can provide. So again, I will send, uh, we will send the, the information on the current uh, policies and funding uh, available also for this type of, uh, of project. We will send this uh, afterwards uh, in writing. There is also a question on when we could have access to this uh, presentation. So normally quite uh, quite early after the presentation it will be made available on the sustainable energy investment forum website and you will receive a notification when this um, this, uh, this powerpoint uh, are uh, ready um, if I can just add one, one last point uh, regarding resources, um, something which is not mentioned on my last slide, we are currently working on a, a, a very dense study on participatory renewable energy projects in France, which I hope will be translated into English. And we're also uh, talking a lot about the implications of the new uh, renewable energy directive. So this might be an additional resource for, for you. Okay. Um, th there is um, I mean, there is a, a question on, uh, I mean, obviously your presentation here is very much focused on, on renewable energy uh, and the question where, where whereas there, there, there was successful uh, experiences with energy efficiency, we will have a presentation, uh, the third presentation focusing more on, on energy efficiency. So there are indeed uh, some, uh, some example of that, uh, but um, there is another question on the clarification of what a participative bonus is. I think you mentioned it for the case of France, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. so just to clarify what it is exactly, mm -hmm. how it works. Okay, uh, just uh, about energy efficiency and renewable energies. I, I won't go too deep into this because we have uh, other presentations. Just to explain maybe uh, why uh, we have seen the development of participatory projects essentially on renewable energies. Uh, I think this is because of two factors. Uh, the first is that uh, the problem of a local acceptance or local opposition to projects is it's mainly something that affects uh, renewable energy projects and much less energy efficiency projects. So that's the first thing. And the second one is that, of course, uh, regarding renewable energy projects, since we have, in most cases, national support mechanisms, we have uh, much less financial risks so we can uh, we can make up a financial plan on on up to on the whole lifetime of the project basically which reduces risks and this makes uh, citizen participation much easier uh, regarding the participatory bonus in france um, so this is about basically uh, uh, the french renewable energy tenders where uh, developers have the possibility they don't need to but they have the possibility to uh, commit themselves to uh, criteria, certain criteria in terms of participatory financing. So generally what they have to achieve is that they need to um, fulfill at least 40% of equity of the project through participatory financing. So uh, regarding solar or wind projects, this can uh, amount to quite huge amounts. So uh, we're sometimes talking about 500,000 to 2 uh, million euros. And if they can demonstrate that they have respected all the criteria and uh, that they have uh, involved uh, a sufficient number of local investors into the project, uh, they get a bonus, which essentially is uh, uh, an additional remuneration for their production. So uh, for each megawatt hour of produced electricity, they get an additional uh, three euros of remuneration on top of the market premium that they got before. Okay. 
Thank you very much. I think it's time now that we move to the second presentation for today uh, with Dan Kruplan from uh, from Rescop um, EU. Um, I will mute your microphone. I think it's done already, and I will unmute Dan. Um, Dan, can you hear me? And can you speak? Yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. And let me start by briefly introducing myself. My name is Dan. I am Belgian and I am current coordinator of Rescope EU, which is the European Federation of Citizen Energy Cooperatives. Our network today represents about 1,500 citizen energy cooperatives from across Europe. And all in all, I think we're about talking about, about 1 million European citizens who are currently uh, participating in one of our members. Uh, so they are a member of one of our cooperatives. What do we do as a federation? Um, well, we mainly provide representation services. So we do a lot of advocacy for our members, have been working quite a bit on the clean energy package, of course. Um, but we also have an interesting toolbox with tools for starting uh, energy cooperatives. We also provide some networking opportunities to our members. And very recently, we also started developing services on electric car sharing and also on financing, which I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Because Resco MISAI stands for mobilizing European citizens to invest in sustainable energy. And it was actually a European project that was funded by the EASME. So thanks a lot for that. And I'm about to share some main takeaways from the project and some main achievements. Next slide, please. Right, um, maybe a few words about the core mission of our federation. Um, Resco PU mainly wants to achieve an energy transition that leads to energy democracy. And what that means to us is well reflected on the chart that you see uh, on the screen. We mainly want our energy system to shift from a system that is based on fossil fuels and nuclear energy and mainly uh, push that to renewables. We also want our, shift, our system to shift from a centralized model to a very decentralized model, from large production facilities to very small scale installations, including solar PV. And most importantly, we want the energy system uh, where, well, we want, we want it to shift from a system with passive consumers to a system where we have uh, prosumers. Uh, I think we all can acknowledge that the energy system uh, will change in the end and that it will require a whole lot of money and that citizens will be paying for that after all, either as a taxpayer, a consumer, or by the, the, by the means that they have on their private banking uh, accounts. So what we mainly wanna do is put citizens in a very active role and accelerate the energy transition so that it can actually benefit citizens in the end and that they can equally share in the profits. Next slide, please. Let me say a few words about the Resco business model because we obviously see that uh, we're brand new in the energy sector and that also leads to a lot of confusion. I will, I will try to explain the Resco business model and I will, I will start by explaining the most traditional one. That is the one that we see occurring uh, most frequently in our federation. And that is the model where on the left-hand side, you have a citizen that puts in money in a cooperative. In this case, that is EcoPower. So he's purchasing at least one share in the cooperative society. And then that money uh, is invested in renewable energy projects. So the citizens can actually benefit from the energy by means that they 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 they, they share in the profits, and so the, the the cooperative benefits from a green certificate system or a feed-in uh, tariff, and that money is then distributed to uh, the cooperative well to the to the cooperative members to the citizens that participate in the scheme. In this case, and that is a model that we also see occurring quite often, is that the energy that is being produced is also sold back uh, at a fair price to the private citizens. So this closes the loop. This is a model that we genuinely see within our federation. Next slide, please. 
Another thing that we usually see is that, well, maybe I will start with uh, saying a few, a few things about the map. Um, a few years ago, we tried to map all the existing uh, energy cooperatives uh, in Europe, and we mainly found, found them in Central and Northern European, well, no, in Western and Northern European countries. About half of these initiatives are now represented in Resco PU. We're a fairly young federation. Um, and the main reason why it's only half is because we haven't managed to get access to their contact details. And we really want to invite them to join our federation and to lead the transition to energy uh, democracy. One mistake that is often made when it comes down to energy cooperatives is that a lot of people, especially DSOs, usually uh, see us as microgrids. And uh, that's, not, that's not always the case. I mean, when we look at our members and we look at these initiatives in Europe, we mainly, well, we, we see uh, renewable energy generators. We have suppliers within our network. We have cooperatives that are dealing with energy efficiency. That includes uh, collective purchasing schemes for LED. We have uh, cooperatives that are taking energy retro or that are taking energy efficiency measures in public buildings. We have cooperatives dealing with collective home renovations. We have grid operators. We have an increasing number of members that are dealing with electric car sharing in communities. We have cooperatives that are dealing with energy monitoring services. So there's a whole range of activities that these cooperatives are developing. It's not just restricted to um, renewable energy production, and it's most certainly not restricted to setting up or running microgrids. It's far more than that. Next slide, please. Okay, let me give you the example of EcoPower. That's the example that I know best because I used to, I used to do project development for this uh, energy cooperative from Belgium. Uh, today, EcoPower is a renewable energy cooperative um, that, that brings together about 54,000 families living in, Flam in Flanders. That's the Flemish uh, region of Belgium. And by issuing shares, they collected about 70 million euro that was invested in renewable energy production installations. Um, the citizens, so the 50,000 families that bought at least one share in this cooperative equally share in the profits, and they also get access to clean energy from local sources, and they do that at a fair price. EcoPower was rewarded as the cheapest energy supplier in the Flemish region uh, for private households. So this is an, it's, it's a fairly large cooperative and it's a perfect model of how citizens can collectively take ownership of the energy system and benefit from that uh, through supplying services. Next slide, please. Another example is uh, very close to Brussels. There is a small cooperative called Biopower and this is actually the, the picture that you see on the screen is a campaign poster that they used within their community because they were planning to replace, um, in collaboration with the local municipality, they decided to replace the traditional streetlights by LED. So it's a, it's a third party financing model and they raised 225,000 euro. So they issued 900 shares of 200 euro, 250 euro each. And they use this campaign poster to convince local citizens to adopt the street light in front of their door. So the city is paying less than they used to and the cooperative gets a stable revenue. And that stable revenue is actually enough to cover the investment and pay a dividend to all the shareholders of this uh, cooperative. And then next slide, please. We will go to Germany. Uh, and in Germany, there's a city called, or a small municipality called Oberbardorf. And I was, I was told that they had this great football club and this, this football club won the championship a few years ago and playing in a higher league also uh, required them to put a roof on top of their stands. Um, unfortunately, the football club spent all its money probably on the best players uh, and they, they lacked the funds to cover that investment themselves. So the fans got together and they decided to set up a cooperative and they, they raised funds from the citizens from the from the fans actually and they managed to 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 build the roof of course and they managed to put solar pv panels on top of it and i was told that the fans now get the chance eh? they 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 share in the profits and they get the chance either they get um a season ticket 
uh, or they get a sausage uh, every time uh, the local football club plays. So dividends can uh, be distributed in various ways. And I think this example really shows how a local cooperative can, can meet local needs. Um, all right, next slide, please. A few words about the benefits of community energy, and these benefits have also been briefly uh, touched upon by uh, Andreas um, in, the, in the former presentation. I think it's quite obvious that uh, community energy or citizen energy cooperatives can foster acceptance for renewable energy. And on the slide, on the page, you see all yellow dots. That's actually a community uh, here in Flounders where uh, the local cooperative EcoPower managed to put large wind turbines. And all the yellow dots are people living close to these wind turbines who actually purchased at least one share in the cooperative society, meaning that they jointly own the, cooper well, the, the wind turbines that have been put there. So it's actually a model and that has been proved by many research that uh, participation schemes can actually foster social acceptance for the energy transition. I think cooperatives can also retain a lot of money in the local economy. Um, that was also uh, said by, uh, by Andreas. And uh, again, there's many research that shows that up to eight times more money can be retained in a local economy. Uh, if you do things through a participant, well, uh, a joint scheme and a cooperative, um, cooperatives also bring a lot of benefits to society. And again, in Eklo, that's the same municipality as the one I was talking about. Uh, part of the profits uh, that came out of the wind turbine were also invested in a charging station for uh, with solar PV and that people can use to charge their electric bikes. Um, cooperatives, uh, well, I mean, people often get access to the clean energy that is being produced at a reasonable cost. As I said, uh, there's cooperatives that are by far the cheapest energy suppliers uh, within their region or within their country. A lot of cooperatives also provide flexibility to the grid. Uh, and that's a concern that we, that we often hear from DSOs is that uh, we are uh, supporting or encouraging people to go off grid. Uh, that's actually not true. Uh, we, we believe that citizens are actually a, a partner of DSOs and that we can help them to provide flexibility to the grid and that this is an important thing to consider uh, in their future business models. So we actually see DSOs as partners rather than as competitors. Um, we also help our members save energy. Well, I told you about collective uh, home renovations and also LED schemes. So there's a whole lot of things these cooperatives do. Next slide, please. We're also very pleased to see that uh, we now have a, a clean energy package with good provisions and good definitions um, for citizen energy communities in uh, and, and renewable energy communities in the Renewable Energy uh, Directive. So we are very happy to see that the European Commission has finally recognized the role of citizens and cooperatives in the future's energy system. Next slide, please. A few years ago, we decided to identify the potential of European prosumership. And with the University of Delft, Delft in the Netherlands, we, we found out that uh, about 50% of uh, the energy that we need by 2050 can be in the hands of prosumers, being individual people who have access to a roof on which they can put uh, solar PV panels or by means of joining a collective scheme like a cooperative. So the potential is there. I think now the transposition at the national level of this clean energy package uh, will, 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 will needs to, uh, we need to capture that potential and make sure that we can really uh, tap into it and, 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 and transform our energy system so that uh, citizens get access to uh, the profits that come out of it. Next slide, please. Now, a few words about Rescoop Mesize. In Rescoop Mesize, we conducted a survey mainly on the financing barriers that uh, our members are currently facing. And we saw that the cooperative business model which includes open membership, meaning that people can easily step in, but also step out, that it leads to variable equity. And considering that cooperatives are dealing with 
quite capital intensive investments makes it sometimes quite complicated to work with this open membership structure. Um, capital intensive uh, investments also make it very hard for starters. Uh, we easily see that people only come on board once the project is there and they can actually see it. That of course makes it very hard for starters who at a certain point need to come up with the money to do the investment. So that's also one of the barriers that we identify. In many countries, there's also national regulations when it comes down to fundraising, um, meaning that it, in, in, in some countries, for instance, once you have, uh, once you raise money from over 100 citizens, you need to comply to a national prospectus law, which of course costs a lot of money and is of course quite burdensome. Um, so that is really something that was flagged by our members when it comes down to uh, national regulations for fundraising. We also see that there's cooperatives that have to bridge long periods with too many or too few projects. And sometimes you, uh, you have established cooperatives that easily raise funds, but that lack the projects to invest in. And on the other hand, you sometimes have, uh, well, you have uh, very low projects or, or, or very few funds, but a lot of projects that you wanna do. So there is a need to bridge that gap. We also see that cooperatives often lack, lack the expertise for complex financing. They're often SMEs, very small initiatives, so they don't have that financial expertise to do these kind of big things. And single investments are often too small for financial instruments like the ones from EIB. Those were the main financing barriers that were identified within our network a couple of years ago when we conducted this survey. Next slide, please. And through the project, we decided to, to, to work on a solution to overcome these barriers. And the solution that we will uh, bring to these cooperatives is called Resco MISAIS SEE. That's, that stands for European Cooperative Society. And Resco MISAIS is a mutual that will aggregate funds from cooperatives, but also from local authorities, including municipalities and cities, and also institutional investors. So it will basically act as a mutual for energy communities and it will allow us to overcome most of these barriers. The mutual was set up uh, by the end of last year so we are now running our test phase um, and the well the the initiators the current members of Resco MISIS are Resco PU in five of its members and that's basically the largest energy cooperatives uh, in Europe. That includes EcoPower from Belgium, but also Courondère from uh, the German-speaking region in Belgium, Enercop from France, Some Energia from Spain, and Energy for All from the UK. Next slide, please. Now, what do we want to do with uh, Resco MISAIS? Um, Andreas told you about this uh, project, Kramer, uh, in the Netherlands. It's a 102 megawatt uh, wind farm um, that was developed by two rather small cooperatives, only a few thousand members. And we they, a few years ago, they, they got back to us and they said, well, we won't manage to raise those funds um, ourselves. I mean, at a certain point, uh, our members will, well, they, they, they are interested in investing, but we are not big enough to cover the whole investment all by ourselves. And so they got back to us and they were wondering if we could help them out. So unfortunately, back then we didn't have Resco MISAIS operational yet, but today that would be a completely different story. We could actually do big projects. For instance, why wouldn't citizens or cooperatives be capable of doing offshore wind? Uh, right now that was, that was a dream because those projects are too capital intensive. But if you aggregate funds from cooperatives from across Europe, including local authorities like cities and municipalities, you can actually handle the big projects too. Next slide, please. Another thing that we are currently considering is to buy existing projects. Um, sometimes we get invitations from private developers that are keen on selling uh, existing projects and we are actually looking into this because buying one of those projects and giving them back to the citizens would actually be very close to our core mission as a federation and as a mutual. Next slide please. We also want to uh, support starting cooperatives. 
as I said, citizens usually only come on board once the project is there. Um, but that, of course, for starters, is often very difficult because at a certain point they need to make the investment before they can actually convince uh, citizens. So we are trying to see whether we could provide them with temporary equity or with a temporary loan so that they could do the investment and then raise the funds from local citizens afterwards and buy out the mutual. So that would be a facilitation service to uh, starting cooperatives. And then the next slide, please. Uh, one last thing is that we can also aggregate uh, projects from within our network of energy cooperatives. And that once we reach uh, the threshold of 30 million euro, we could apply for ELENA funds. And right now we are working on a scheme in Belgium, in, a, in, a, in the province close to Brussels, where we are aggregating projects in close collaboration with municipalities. We are aggregating those projects and we are trying to reach the threshold of 30 million euro to obtain the ELENA funds so that we can actually start doing the project development. Another thing we could do by aggregating uh, by aggregating projects in an investment portfolio would be reaching the size of 25 million euro uh, that is needed to obtain soft loans from EIB. And I think the next slide will be a, thank you very much for your attention. So um, thanks a lot. If you have any questions, I think you will have some time to, to, to ask me those questions now, but if not, uh, I kindly invite you to go to the websites of Rescope EU and Rescope Misize or to send me an email to info at rescope.eu. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We we have indeed a few minutes for, for uh, questions and answers. Uh, so, so I have a first uh, question coming back to your slide presenting the, the distribution of, of cooperative in Europe. Uh, if I find it. Uh, there was a question on um, why are there less uh, initiatives in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Eastern and Central Europe? Mm -hmm. And do you have any specific action to, to promote initiative uh, over there? Yeah. So first, first a few words about when this exercise was done. This is part of an exercise that we did a couple of years ago. So I'm confident that if we would do that exercise uh, again, we would probably see more initiatives arising in Central Eastern European countries. However, one of the things that we learned is that the word cooperative is still easily associated with communism uh, in those countries. And that is really a hurdle for people to really start getting engaged. So that is probably the number one reason. A second reason is that these, uh, in, these, in these countries, there's usually, uh, well, there used to be low support for renewable energy production, uh, which also means that it's less interesting for people to actually start looking into alternatives. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, in those countries um, not always have the financial means to, 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 to make additional investments in renewable energy production installations. So that was part of the result of a, a survey or a study that we conducted a few years ago. Right now, we already see that in many countries, uh, things are changing for the better. Um, we have some very positive results uh, coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have members now from Slovenia, from Croatia. Uh, we see things changing in Poland as well. So I'm confident that if we would make this exercise in a few years from now, that it would probably be more, uh, that there would be more initiatives in those countries. And that's also one of the things that we are trying to do. We are working uh, on many projects, uh, which also include members and, and, and cooperatives from uh, those um, specific regions. And we really see it as a, a a important objective of our federation to kickstart the transition in those countries too. Thank you. Uh, a second question on how exactly can energy cooperative models help uh, provide uh, more grid flexibility? Uh, mm -hmm. Clarification on one of the, of the comments you've made. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and actually right now we, participating in some projects where we are testing smart grid integration technology. So if you can aggregate flexibility from your members, 
um, and invite them, for instance, to turn off their lights at a certain point, you are actually providing flexibility to a grid. Of course, there's a whole lot of things you need to have. Uh, you need to be able to communicate to the sleep, be able to, uh, so, but this is basically the idea of a cooperative virtual power plant. Right now, we are asking large production facilities to switch off at a certain point, but we can also see whether we could, as, as end users, as consumers, aggregate our powers and aggregate uh, our behavior so that we can actually provide flexibility and turn off our washing machines in case there's no sunlight, for instance. Okay, uh, a third question on the business model. Uh, is it possible for local citizens to provide debt funding in addition to equity funding? Uh, and what is the, the business model you, you have? The business model that we that we adopt or that we see happening the most is with uh, equity funding. So people put in money and then of course these this this money and invested in, in in projects. And it depends. I mean, in some cases uh, there's cooperatives that only do uh, projects using their private equity, but there's also cooperatives that prefer to do more projects and to leverage or to use the the equity as a leverage to get a loan or to obtain a loan and to do bigger projects. So it really depends and it uh, there's a whole range of uh, models that we see occurring when it comes down to financing renewable energy. It is, uh, is such a business model fit for uh, renovation of public buildings, for example? Well, we did some 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 tests on that in the last couple of years. We had a few members who were uh, teaming up with um, with local authorities to 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 initiate public well uh, energy retrofits in public buildings, and it turns out that uh, the model could work, um, but that we need well. I think one of the main conclusions of that is that a lot of cooperatives indicated that having enough renewable energy projects that are profitable, of course, and that allow you with, uh, well, that, that that provide you with a, um, with a strong basis so that you can actually consider other things than renewable energy. So I think to summarize, in, in most cases, our cooperatives indicate that having renewable energy projects is a prerequisite before they can actually start looking into energy efficiency. And that also includes investments um, in public buildings. But it is possible and we managed to do at least a few projects that were quite successful. And one last question regarding the type of support that you could provide it is, uh, if a small NGO working in sustainable development project is uh, interested in establishing a cooperative? Do you, do you provide a fundamental explanation of the fundamental requirement, uh, some, uh, some recommendation on how to get started? Yeah, absolutely. So if you go to the website of rescoop.eu, you will find a, a, a specific section dedicated to starters that includes a whole lot of resources that you can use to, to, to basically get started. And then the, the main questions you need to ask yourself, so it's it's basically interesting tools, but of course you can also reach out to us and we are there to help you out and to, to, to put you in contact with, uh, with other people. Um, so, I mean, yes, there's definitely a facilitation service on that um, and don't hesitate to reach out to us if you need any support. Okay, so thank you very much. I think we need to move to the third uh, presentation with uh, Carlo Alivi from uh, we are starting presenting uh, equity crowdfunding for non-domestic uh, building renovation. So I will unmute your microphone. I think, Carlo, um, yeah. I think, Carlo, Here you I can. Yeah. Okay, thanks for inviting me and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as the previous panelists uh, indicated, investment crowdfunding is definitely one of the options for the financing of uh, sustainable energy projects. Um, 
First of all, um, it is important to know that most of the companies that raise money through investment crowdfunding are small and medium enterprises, uh, also because larger companies already have access to capital through traditional systems. Uh, next slide, please. It should be noted that single states within the European Union have different regulations for investment crowdfunding. Uh, many of them, including Italy, focusing on all SMEs according to the EU definition that is summarized in this slide. Uh, importantly, SMEs uh, are the eligible target uh, also for, uh, the, according to the proposal for regulation on European crowdfunding service providers, which is currently being discussed by the EU lawmaking institutions. As you can see from the parameters set to identify small and medium enterprises, according to the EU definition, most of the early stage companies and of the special purpose vehicles that are commonly, commonly used for green projects can raise money thanks to investment crowdfunding on authorized portals such as uh, we are starting. Uh, our portal is an equity crowdfunding platform which is active uh, in Italy. Uh, so please note that uh, some of the indications and uh, conclusions uh, in this presentation might be uh, slightly different when you consider lending-based crowdfunding, which is actually uh, quite common to fund uh, green projects uh, or other countries. Uh, next slide, please. As all of us uh, know, most of the traditional financing sources are not scalable, uh, meaning that the more money a company raises, the more raising money gets difficult because issues arise from increasing complexity, for example, in terms of governance and from risk concentration. Investment crowdfunding can be scalable for two reasons. A, uh, there is no risk concentration because the investments are distributed across a large number of uh, investors. And B, uh, if the project itself or the sponsor performs well, there can be opportunities to increase the amounts of money raised for a number of reasons, uh, such as the presence of investors already on board, word of mouth, uh, media coverage, and web presence. Uh, next slide, please. Generally speaking, equity crowdfunding is not only uh, about money and returns. Uh, in fact, there are many other benefits you can easily imagine, even when applied to projects associated with uh, uh, the renovation of buildings, for example, especially if uh, uh, these uh, buildings are open to the public and host the businesses. For example, um, I anticipate we will talk about uh, the case of a publicly owned sport palace where the matches of uh, a, a top uh, Italian uh, female volleyball, volleyball team are played. Um, the secondary effects uh, uh, of uh, an investment crowdfunding campaign are the creation of connections with existing and potential customers and supporters. Uh, before me, uh, some examples have already been uh, discussed, uh, but there is also the opportunity to evaluate the interest of the public uh, in some products or services, uh, communi communication and marketing benefits, and finally the creation of uh, uh, new business uh, opportunities. Next uh, slide, please. The current uh, main challenge for the market of energy efficiency comes uh, from the lack of effective funding and management options. Uh, many of uh, the current obstacles hindering the development of uh, this market that has a huge potential uh, can often be solved thanks uh, to equity crowdfunding that is a very inclusive solution. Now we'll tell you uh, more about uh, a success case that was completed on our platform. Uh, next uh, slide, please. 
Uh, it is uh, actually the first equity crowdfunding campaign uh, that was completed for a special purpose vehicle associated with uh, a specific energy efficiency project, according to the European portal Cities Energy that lists uh, uh, the crowdfunding campaign for green businesses uh, in the European Union. Uh, well, next slide, please. Uh, the NUCO uh, raised 65,000 euros uh, through equity crowdfunding on a total investment of approximately 330,000 uh, euros to renovate uh, the main sport palace of the municipality of uh, Bustarsizia, uh, which is uh, a, a town with more than 80,000 inhabitants uh, in northern Italy. Most of the <clears throat> remaining uh, portion of the investment was obtained thanks uh, to traditional credit from the banking system. Um, the, uh, a diverse, diversified group of 18 investors, uh, 10 individuals and 8 companies provided the equity funding for uh, this campaign. The intervention is actually uh, very simple and includes uh, improvement on the uh, eating and lighting systems and also on the envelopes, on the envelope, sorry. Next slide, please. Thanks to this pilot campaign, we discovered that equity crowdfunding for this type of projects work and gener generates a lot of uh, interest. All the involved parties, uh, the municipality that owns the building and the company managing it, but also the contractor and the supporters were enthusiastic about the process. Uh, each of them obtained uh, several uh, benefits and most of them agree that the intervention would have hardly become a reality without uh, the equity crowdfunding campaign. Even the traditional financial system, uh, banks in particular, saw the uh, innovative financing solution for the project uh, posi positively. On the negative side, despite the high interest generated by the campaign that took place during the summer, few average people invested in the campaign. Uh, it is now clear to us that the business model based on energy performance contract is still difficult to understand for most of the people. And uh, this uh, is uh, one of the answers to the questions that uh, were raised uh, earlier on, um, in our opinion. Um, please note that we have uh, already hosted successful campaigns for special purpose vehicles and holdings focusing on electric mobility and renewable energy and we saw uh, a wider crowd of non-experts uh, taking part to the campaigns as well as uh, a lower incidence of questions related to the business model um, apparently uh, revenues of uh, revenues from charging stations and uh, tariffs and electricity, electricity sold are more, more intuitive uh, than revenues from savings. Therefore, not uh, surprisingly, the majority uh, of the investors that funded uh, the campaign to renovate the Sport Palace had uh, have some knowledge uh, uh, of the sector. Interestingly, interestingly, for example, few of the contributors also managed uh, to get involved uh, in uh, the works uh, of uh, the project. Uh, and finally, uh, it is uh, not worthy, uh, the most uh, unexpected type of investor uh, was uh, a manager of uh, a large number of uh, swimming pools uh, that uh, was interested in uh, renovating them and wanted to discover how uh, this uh, funding process uh, works. works. Uh, so this uh, project uh, is actually triggering the use of equity crowdfunding for other renovation projects uh, we could see uh, raising money uh, in the coming months. However, there is no doubt uh, if we want to raise large amounts of money for 
energy performance projects, we need to bring non-experts on board. And next uh, slide, please. As we said, many potential investors do not, do not have a clear understanding of the business models associated with energy performance projects. So we need to describe them uh, to make it easy to understand. We need to work on the storytelling and to show the results of companies that got funded. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we are uh, really focusing on uh, that to uh, tell how the works are uh, going uh, with this uh, sport palace and uh, the actual savings uh, uh, that uh, are being obtained. Uh, look at, uh, looking at uh, uh, this uh, specific topic, interesting, interestingly, one of the companies that took part to the funding uh, with a small amount is a startup that uh, adapted its solution for energy monitoring and the dynamic control to make it easy to understand even for non-experts. Uh, you can see a mock-up on uh, the right. Uh, people will basically understand more uh, by monitoring the parameters in the building and KPIs. Therefore, they will be able to see the effects of their small or large investment. We also plan to focus more on the expertise and the reputation of the subject, subjects uh, involved uh, in the projects. Well, and uh, on the marketing side, it is possible to create win-win uh, rewards, incentivizing the participation of uh, investors, such as the tickets, uh, uh, discounts, uh, uh, or advertising opportunities that were uh, also uh, described uh, earlier. Um, this is particularly interesting uh, if uh, we are talking about uh, museums uh, or sport palaces, for example. The avail availability of co-investment schemes uh, from public or private uh, uh, investors could speed up uh, the spreading of equity crowdfunding for these kind of projects as well. Uh, more in general, a more friendly and defined regulation could help the sector. Uh, it is worth mentioning that uh, the European Union uh, is discussing a unique investment crowdfunding regulation for all the EU. Of course, this, this change would create a very inter interesting environment. As said earlier, the first pilot projects uh, involve simple interventions, such as special purpose vehicles for single interventions for renewable energy, energy efficiency, or electric mobility. But we already see SPVs uh, for multiple interventions, and even holding companies uh, that are launching uh, campaigns uh, on equity crowdfunding platforms or uh, are applying. In the long term, uh, we expect and we hope that uh, more complex uh, solutions will also be the focus of uh, future campaigns. Uh, in fact, we expect uh, there will also be a pipeline of projects where, for example, community projects uh, with uh, distributed energy production and storage, uh, demand uh, response solution, and uh, district eating uh, projects uh, will become relevant. Uh, also because uh, uh, all these kind of projects are somehow quite in line with the concepts of uh, crowdsourcing. Um, one last thing, uh, we can go to the last uh, slide. Uh, I want to talk uh, about the stage of the works of the Sport Palace, because funding is a relevant topic, but the results are even more uh, important. Well, the works on the lighting systems uh, have been completed, and uh, the other works uh, will be finalized uh, within a few months. So savings are uh, already happening, and uh, they will grow in the next few months. Uh, interesting, interestingly, uh, just after the old lighting system was replaced by an efficient 
LED system. Uh, the local female volleyball team won the women's uh, CV Cup, the second top official competition for women's uh, volleyball clubs of Europe under the new lights. So maybe uh, energy efficiency brings uh, some luck uh, too. We will definitely uh, investigate uh, this uh, aspect in the future. Jokes apart, uh, I thank you for the attention and uh, I'm available to answer any questions uh, you may have. Uh, anyway, you can also find my contacts uh, on this uh, slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the for the pres presentation and uh, indeed keep us uh, posted of the results of this uh, specific inquiry. Uh, we do have a few minutes still to ask questions and, and provide answers. Uh, maybe we can start with a few questions specifically targeting uh, Carlo. And then uh, if we still have time, we can spend a few more minutes on a uh, question and answer for the three uh, presenters today. Um, so I have a first question for, for Carlo. Uh, regarding what uh, investors are getting back in return of, of their investment, for example, in the ESBA project, uh, what is uh, what is it they're getting back from their uh, investment? Well, uh, they're getting, uh, first of all, shares uh, of uh, the company, of course, as we're talking about equity crowdfunding. Um, then uh, they also obtained uh, a tax break uh, as uh, the company uh, was uh, registered as uh, innovative startup and uh, this uh, enable, enabled uh, investors uh, to get a 30 percent uh, tax break on uh, the amount invested uh, for people uh, and uh, a smaller tax break for uh, companies uh, in this case, uh, uh, rewards uh, were not uh, uh, foreseen, uh, but uh, um, this is something we will definitely uh, put in place for next cases, uh, because we really believe uh, that uh, it can be an important way to uh, get people closer to uh, this type of uh, projects. Okay. Um, a second question. Um, so the the project you've presented here in, in uh, Italy, uh, can the platform be used elsewhere uh, in Europe or outside uh, Europe? Well, um, at the moment, uh, single nations uh, have uh, specific uh, regulations and uh, cross-border. Um, campaigns are actually very rare. Um, investors, investments from abroad are uh, possible, uh, but they're not uh, uh, very common. Um, we are in the latest uh, stage of the discussion of uh, uh, the unique regulation for the European Union, and I'm pretty sure that uh, um, if approved, uh, uh, this uh, new regulation uh, would definitely change uh, this thing. And so there will be a, a unique uh, market, so a pan-European market for investment crowdfunding. So that's the hope. Okay, uh, a third question uh, related to the amount raised through uh, equity crowdfunding. In the case that uh, you, you you have a certain amount needed, but you just can raise part of it, uh, does this help uh, uh, facilitate uh, the financing of the rest? The, how do you cover the rest that uh, is not uh, rich through the targeted crowdfunding, or is it? Um, yeah. Well. Uh, um, campaigns are typically set with a minimum goal. Uh, and a maximum uh, goal. Uh, so uh, you typically set uh, the uh, minimum goal to make the project possible, and you set uh, uh, the maximum goal 
in order to have uh, a fully op optimized uh, financial structure. Okay. Um, so maybe, uh, and, and also you, you, you presented this as, as a way for cooperation also in, between uh, energy suppliers, ESCO, uh, building owners. Uh, do you see a role for uh, EPC facilitators also in this scheme and, uh, and what, uh, how can crowdfunding support their activities in uh, facilitating EPC market? Well, uh, I think that uh, um, equity crowdfunding is a powerful tool to connect uh, different players uh, in, uh, in the market, uh, even at uh, uh, a local level, uh, it is uh, really uh, difficult to coordinate. Um, we saw that uh, uh, with uh, uh, the electric mobility project we funded, um, no single entity was willing to uh, start a project, but uh, when an SPV was created and uh, started uh, collecting money, uh, a lot of uh, uh, players uh, got on board. Um, so it was, uh, it really made something uh, possible that would have not, would have not happened uh, without uh, this uh, uh, tool. Of course, uh, even uh, even uh, facilitating uh, players uh, can play a role. Uh, it, campaigns can be a good way to monitor uh, new opportunities uh, and to get in touch with uh, a project in the moment uh, at the moment when. Uh, uh, it is being uh, structured. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe we, we still have a few minutes left. Maybe we can open the, the question also for the rest of, uh, of, the, of the panel. Um, coming back also for, on some elements that were presented uh, before. Um, I have a, a question that can be addressed by, by the three speakers. It's uh, Regarding uh, the independence and role in the governance, uh, the, the, um, how, how do you and future community retain independence within aggregation? We say that there was a need to aggregate and make bigger projects, uh, but how can you, uh, as a community, retain your independence and, and say within the, the governance of the project? Um, Maybe, maybe Dan, would you would you be happy to to answer this one? If I can, I think I can. Yeah. Sure. Dan, are you still with us? Yeah, I am still here, and I heard a question. Um, I think it's a very good question, um, and I think um, most cooperatives that we see within our network will mainly target projects within their own communities. So the need for scaling up is there, but I think uh, it shouldn't be underestimated what you can do at the local level. So I think there's no need to uh, worry about giving up your independence. Uh, I think there's a whole lot of things that you can do within your community and the, the possibilities are, are quite big there. Um, however, there is a possibility, and that's also the reason why we decided to set up Rescope Mises. Um, there is a possibility that you say, well, as a cooperative, we are now looking into bigger projects and we want to do collaborations with others. Um, so therefore, you have this, this, this uh, mutual, um, which you are, again, that's a, it's a free choice. People can, or it's not people, it's cooperatives can join if they like. Um, but I don't see any problem with giving up your independence um, for that. Uh, another thing that relates to independence is quite important, and that is something that we see happening here in Belgium. There's a whole lot of uh, private companies that decide to set up cooperatives themselves. Um, they're not really autonomous because they maintain all powers, but they issue shares um, from citizens um, so that they could foster social acceptance for their projects. 
Um, but in fact, what they do is they issue shares through the cooperative and then they give a subordinated loan to um, to uh, to well to the, to the big utility. So that's not really a model that we are uh, supporting or endorsing within our federation. So I think independence uh, within the governance structure of a cooperative is is quite important, and it should maintain in the hands of citizens rather than big utilities. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that there are a number of other more more specific questions, so maybe we 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 will take the time to address this uh, these questions later on by uh, by email. And I think it's time now for for us to conclude uh, this webinar. So uh, as I said in the introduction, the material will be made available. On the um, on the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum website, uh, both uh, the, the presentation from the, the speakers and also a link to the uh, EASME YouTube channel where you will find the recording of this uh, of this webinar. Uh, we will get back to to those who, who, who did not receive an answer during this live uh, session uh, by uh, by email. Um, and um, and also we will provide some information, as I said, on the EU uh, current policies and funding opportunities. In particular, uh, I uh, just mentioned here a few uh, budget lines that we have open now, uh, with a deadline in uh, in September, on the third of September this year, to support energy efficiency finance. And you could notably find support under the topic EE9 on innovative. Uh, financing schemes um, and uh, and so I, I encourage you to look at these uh, different topics that are open you have the links here with the topic description there will be also further material to uh, to explain exactly what these topics are about and how you can get uh, support from uh, from the European Commission um, I, I thank you again for your attendance to this uh, to this meeting uh, I thank uh, the three the three speakers for their very uh, interesting and clear uh, presentations, and I hope that you stay connected for our next webinar that would uh, happen normally end of uh, June, uh, with a title and content still to be to be fully defined. But uh, stay tuned to get all the information uh, needed. So thanks again, thanks to the speaker, thanks to Climate Alliance also for their support in organizing this uh, this webinar and uh, have a nice uh, have a nice day